Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. And that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study. We are continuing our look at all things paranormal from a biblical Christian perspective, a study series that I have simply titled Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. And uh, I'm excited because now we're starting to get into uh, some of the meat, I think, of this study that a lot of you who are watching have been looking forward to. And uh, I think that uh, you're going to be very happy with a lot of the information that we're going to be sharing uh, in the next several weeks. And uh, before we begin this after or this evening, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. So join me if you would. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for once again another opportunity to explore the depths and the riches and the heights of the Word of God. What a treasure we have in this glorious sacred text. Master, tonight, God, I ask that you would loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the Spirit of God to quicken our minds, quicken our thinking, to help us understand and grasp those things which be of the Spirit. For we know, Lord, that the carnal mind is enmity against God and cannot understand the things of God. We must have the assistance of the Spirit of God. Master, move in this Bible study tonight. Use your word to speak deliverance and healing and victory to those who are watching both live and those who will watch later by reason of recording. Use us tonight, Lord. Encourage us, cause our faith to grow and be inspired, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm going to move right into this tonight so that we can uh, get moving right along, okay? Uh, we are looking at, the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at the rules that are in place, as it were, uh, as they relate to the spirit realm. And uh, by that I mean we're understanding the parameters uh, in which spiritual influences operate. Um, God operates by the same rules that the enemy operates by. The Lord has established immutable eternal rules, and you'll find that they parallel, that the Lord does things the same way that he expects the enemy to do things, okay? So, let's look tonight. Satan takes advantage of both intended and unintended invitations. In order for a spirit to operate in our life, uh, it has to be allowed, it has to be given an opening, a door has to be opened, they have to somehow, some way, have been given permission. I talked last week about the fact, uh, in talking about unintended permission, that's like somebody going to their front, to their back door, let's say, to let the dogs out of the house to use the restroom. And you're negligent. You don't lock the screen door when you uh, let the dogs out and you go back into the house to do whatever it is you're going to do. You leave your uh, interior door wide open. So somebody on the outside that might w would like to illegally gain access to your home is able to look and see and say, hmm, 
they didn't lock that screen door and the secondary door, the interior door, is wide open. So I've got an invitation. I've got an opening right there. They, they figuratively as well as literally opened a door. Demonic spirits, my friend, take advantage of things as simple as that. All they need is an opening. All they need is an opportunity. We've already looked at the fact that the spirit realm operates in levels of power and authority, principalities, powers, uh, and we, I've tried to explain that uh, the initial spirit that enters is generally going to be one of the lowest level, one of the weakest, one of uh, a, a, a spirit having very little authority, not really having a great amount of power. But what they are able to do is run recognizance. They're able to go ahead of the guys that have a lot more power and a lot more authority. And they're able to gain entrance, to gain access. And once they've gained access, their job is to clear the way, make the path clear for more powerful, more authoritative spirits than to follow. So they're going to take that door that you've left slightly ajar, and they're going to do everything in their power to help you push that door open further and further and further and further. Ultimately, they want that door wide open. They want it, you know, wide open so that uh, your life and your circumstances uh, are at their full disposal. As children of God, we are to live our lives cognizant of the fact that uh, these spirits are out there operating. You know, um, we're not, our church is not a hellfire and brimstone church. I do not preach a hellfire and brimstone message. And there's a reason for that, because if you understand grace from a biblical perspective, then everything in the life of a believer, even failure, even sin, even tripping, even falling, uh, everything is not a heaven or hell issue. Uh, we will answer for things in the judgment. We will stand before God and, and we will be responsible for those things which we've done in the flesh, but not everything immediately is determining heaven or hell. Uh, however, at the same time, Christians are to live a Christian life. We're to try to abide to the best of our ability by the teaching and mandate of Scripture. Why do we do this? Because if we don't, God's going to throw us into hell, you know, uh, in an angry rage? No. No. As believers, we understand that responding to life circumstances and situations in any manner short of a biblically prescribed Christian response leaves us vulnerable. There are spiritual influences out there that are just looking for an opportunity to begin to work on us from the outside. They want to vex us. They want to oppress us. They want to attach themselves to us. Ultimately, they would love to be able to take up residence within us, if at all possible. So, it's important to understand just how it is that we open doors to uh, demonic spiritual influences, okay? Evil spirits take advantage of many things, ranging from uh, spiritual interaction, and what I mean by that is uh, the people that we interact with in terms of spiritual things. We often refer to that as 
um, those with whom we engage in fellowship. Uh, it's not a matter of going to somebody's house and visiting them. It's not a matter of them coming to our house and visiting us. No, uh, it is, do we go into churches that teach things that we know to be false and inaccurate and incorrect? Uh, do we take risks, and you do take risks, by inviting Mormon missionaries into your home? to share their doctrine with you? Do we take risks by uh, thinking we're going to do some good and convince these Jehovah's Witnesses that their doctrine is inaccurate and wrong? Um, you've got to be very careful about spiritual interactions. And uh, that's why, personally, I am uh, very selective about churches that I go into, um, and people that I fellowship with, you know, at a spiritual level, everybody doesn't have to be where I'm at. Everybody doesn't have to have the understanding that I have, the revelation that I have. Uh, we don't have to agree on every single point of doctrine. Uh, however, if there is gross error in their teaching and in their belief system, uh, then I am going to avoid them. I'm not, I'm not even going to bother. The Bible tells us, have no fellowship, no fellowship, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. doesn't say people who live in darkness. It says the works of darkness. That is spiritual activity that is of a less than biblical, less than accurate, less than truthful uh, nature, okay? So people who engage in these things, I can visit with them, I can be friends with I actually knew a man in New York City who was a uh, practitioner in a um, African religion, an ancient African religion, and I can't remember off the top of my head how I came to know him and everything. Uh, we never engaged in anything even remotely uh, akin to, uh, you know, anything of a spiritual nature. Um, at best, we visited and talked, and I learned quite a bit about his uh, religion and the way they did things and what have you. And um, as a matter of fact, I shocked him once because uh, I happened to be at his home and he had a, a lady coming to counsel with him. And he said, well, can you excuse me for a little bit? I need to talk to this lady. And I said, yeah, well, I was sitting just a room away and I couldn't hear, I couldn't help, I should say, but over here, everything they were discussing and everything. And uh, when they got done and he came in and said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I just need to talk to her for a little bit. I looked at him and I said, that woman's got demons. And he looked at me and I mean, literally, he had a shocked look on his face. And he said, how do you know that? And uh, I said, well, I know because... Uh, there's a gift that God gives in the church called discernment of spirits. And when there are spirits that are not of God in, in the vicinity, I said, I can generally pick them out like, you know, uh, like flies on a picnic basket. I mean, I, I can really pick up on them very quickly. <clears throat> and uh, he believed in demon possession. The problem is his religion was one of those that actually believes they can manipulate spirits and they can control spirits. And so uh, basically he looked at it like she'd gotten hold of some spirits that she ultimately couldn't control, so now they're controlling her. And of course, we don't share that perspective. But anyway, uh, that was many, many years ago. So spiritual interaction 
is very important and we've got to be very careful who uh, we fellowship with, who we engage in religious ritual with, uh, who we pray with for that matter. Okay, emotions play a huge role <clears throat> in creating openings for uh, demonic spirits. Human emotion will betray you every time. And spirits know that they can use everything from pain, be that emotional pain, psychological pain, physical pain, anger, jealousy, bitterness, vengeance, malice, um, all of these sort of emotions are avenues through which human beings can inadvertently invite negative spiritual influences. Evil spirits can and will also take advantage of ungodly conduct. So if we knowingly and wittingly engage in conduct uh, that is contrary to God, then we are potentially opening a door to a spirit. Um, this is why... Um, in part, this is why we do not engage in activities that um, cause our thinking and uh, our feelings, we lose control of them. That can be through drunkenness, that can be through drug uh, use and what have you. Mind-altering substances, we don't use those, we don't allow those things in our lives because um, they can cause us at times to do things. We lose our inhibitions and we wind up doing or saying things or acting in ways that were we in control of our faculties, we would not have done or would not have acted or would not have said. If we willingly engage in conduct which is contrary to godliness, we can in so doing, uh, make ourselves vulnerable to spiritual influences. Evil spirits also take advantage of situations which may elicit a faithless or a godless reaction, such as situations, for instance, that cause distress, that cause anger or fear. If we respond and react to a situation that causes us distress in a faithless or a godless manner, then the potential exists for us just leaving that door. I'm not talking about swinging the door wide open and saying, come on, devil, come on in and help me, you know, <laughs> be uh, a, a lunatic. I'm not saying that, but it, these are things that just start the opening, that begin to push the door open, and spirits will take advantage of these things. Again, this is why God made it so easy for us to settle issues in heaven where we step out of line and we act wrong, we speak wrong, we do wrong. The word of God promising, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and, here's the key, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only does the Lord forgive, but he wipes away any stain, as it were, that that action or those words or that reaction may have brought upon us, and it is that stain that the enemy would like to use, all right? So the Lord is literally kind of helping to reclose the door. So when we say something perhaps we shouldn't have said or react to a situation in a way we ought not to have reacted, it's as simple as later saying, Lord, I'm so sorry, forgive me. I should never have acted like that. 
And uh, that's all it takes. And according to the word of God, the matter is settled. The Lord cleans up our mess, as it were, and the door is shut in the enemy's face. So thank God he has made it so easy for believers uh, to walk in victory. Now listen, spirits do not have free course. By this I mean, a spirit must be welcomed or invited, as I've been saying. Evil spirits do not have free course to simply take possession or to move into, as it were, any person whom they choose. They can't do that. It, it, that, that is outside of the rules that God has established. God himself does not move in on people who do not open a door to him. The baptism of the Holy Ghost does not uh, simply fall upon people um, who have no knowledge of it and have no understanding of it and uh, have no interest in it, because if that were true, then God would be filling Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalians around the globe with the Holy Ghost. No, the Holy Ghost began to fall in the early uh, 20th century as people's hearts were growing hungry and they were asking God for more of himself. And they were literally saying, you know, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me to be what you want me to be and to behave as you'd have me behave. Help me to have the power to walk in victory and to be a testimony and um, to live a life that is exemplary of your love and your grace. And the Lord responded to those cries with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at the turn of the 20th century. The Word of God said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, meaning those who desire to do right, for they shall be filled. Hallelujah. And that's what he did at that time. So God doesn't just move into people's lives uninvited. Um, you know, this is why I can believe in divine healing until the cows come home. But I can't just walk into a hospital and go room to room and, and heal everybody, uh, you know, that's in the hospital. If that were possible, then I'm sure by now somebody would have already done it and the hospitals would be empty and they'd be crying and moaning about uh, lack of funds, but you don't see that happening. No, because there is an eternal, immutable law in place. Uh, there has to be an opening, and the Lord will take advantage, just like the enemy. If you leave the door open a crack, then the Lord will take advantage of that, and he will try to communicate with you. He'll try to speak to you. He'll try to, uh, like a lover or as a love interest, he'll try to swoon you. You know, he'll try to kind of lure you and uh, convince you to draw closer to him in the same way that an evil spirit will do the opposite, okay? Um, so a spirit cannot simply move into the life uh, of any individual uh, at will or else all human beings would be occupied by demons. There is a rule, there is a mechanism whereby they are allowed by God uh, to take up residence or to establish relationship and uh, establish a stronghold. Those mechanisms include, listen carefully, invitation, proximity, meaning you're too close to something you ought not to be too close to. You know, uh, to get burned, you don't have to walk into a fire. All you have to do is put your hand too close to the burner on the stove and you're going to get burned. And so proximity, distress, meaning circumstances in our life that cause us distress. Do we respond in faith? Do we respond in a biblical Christian manner to distresses? Or 
Do we respond in a manner that is not godly and uh, we start accusing God, we start getting angry at God, you know, these sort of things. Uh, that's where we're dancing on some pretty thin ice. Ungodliness, meaning evil, wicked, ungodly behavior. Spiritual interaction, like I said before, that means fellowship and communion with uh, people who are not of a similar spiritual mind as we. False doctrine can be an opening, folks. All you got to do sometimes is start believing uh, one idiotic doctrine, one foolish thought, one little item that is completely contrary to the Word of God. And you'll, all of a sudden you'll see that door being pushed open and before too long that person is buying into and swallowing bigger and bigger lies, bigger and bigger falsehoods, bigger and bigger uh, doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God, contrary uh, to the higher knowledge of the living God. And lastly, they can use negligence or a lack of diligence Meaning, again, we are not careful how we do things, and therefore uh, we leave that back door open and we don't lock the uh, screen door. And actually, lastly, number eight is human emotion. They use human emotion. <clears throat> when you saw Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he was literally trying to use his emotions against him. He knew that in the flesh, this man, Jesus, albeit he was God in human form, but God was playing by the rules. And the rules were that if he was going to live a human existence, he was going to live as a human. That's why the Word of God says that he humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant, and he became obedient uh, unto death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord literally applied a set of rules to himself. If I'm going to walk among them as a human, then I have got to make myself subject to the same passions, to the same temptations. Again, this is why the Word of God tells us we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted in all like manner as we. He was affected by hunger. He was affected by fear. He was affected by distress. He was affected by anxiety. He was affected by depression. All of the things that we as human beings are affected by, things that can work against our spiritual man, the Lord made himself subject unto. The enemy knew this. As I've said before, he was trying to uh, stop the plan of God before it ever reached the cross. So in the wilderness, he says, uh, well, if you're really the son of God, if you're really God in human form, then why don't you just talk to this stone and turn it to bread? And uh, he was trying to use the Lord's hunger that physical distress that he was going through. He was trying to use that against him. He was trying to use his emotions. You know what? I can spare you all the agony that you have put yourself in line for, and you know that according to the rules that you established, the rules that you spoke into existence at the beginning of creation, you know that you're going to have to endure your friends turning on you, everybody turning their back on you, being scourged, being beaten, being hung on a cross. You know what's coming. 
but I can spare you all that if you'll just bow down and worship me. Hey, it's just a transaction. No big deal. Just play the game with me. And he was trying to use the Lord's emotions against him. So uh, this is how the enemy works, folks. False doctrine, you know, takes them to a high place that, hey, the Bible said that he'll send his angels to uh, take charge over you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Pulling something from the word of God out of context, trying to use it in a manner that is inaccurate and untrue. And the Lord responded with truth. He responded with the word of God. And this is how, as believers, we are called to act. This is how we are called to conduct ourselves. That's why I say the temptation of the Lord in the wilderness had more to do with setting an example for us as believers than it did uh, anything, you know, concerning the Lord himself even. Um, that was there. That was written. That is recorded for our benefit <clears throat> so that we can see and learn how to properly respond to life circumstances and situations, to distresses. I don't know about you, but folks, I've been through some hard times in my life. I've been hungry. I have been miserably hungry. Uh, there were some days in my uh, younger life when I was uh, without food, had no money to buy food, and I went for days and days without eating a morsel and uh, never ever dawned on me, not one time to go out and beg or to ask people for money or, you know, anything like that. I, it just wasn't in me to do that. And uh, I sat in my room and starved. And I mean, it got to the point, one particular instance I recall, it got to the point where I couldn't even hold a glass of water because my body shook so bad. Um, I, 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 I was in horrible condition. And I couldn't even hold a glass of water because my whole body was just shaking. I was so hungry. And um, there are some people, when they go through trials and tribulations and struggles, they start accusing God. They start turning on God. Instead of turning to the Lord, they turn away from the Lord. Instead of calling out to Him for assistance, they start uh, yelling at him and cursing him and cussing him. You remember with the uh, temptation of Job, uh, Satan told the Lord, yeah, but you know, if you take that hedge you've got around him down, he'll curse you to your face. And then when that didn't work, he said, well, you know, if you allow me to touch his body and he has to deal with sickness and disease, he'll curse you to, his, to your face. And this is how the enemy works. This is what he's looking for. He's looking for us to respond to things in an ungodly, uh, unchristlike, unbiblical manner. And so this is why it is so important that we genuinely be disciples of Christ. A disciple is not one who follows. A disciple is one who embraces a discipline as it is set forth by their leader, their master. Okay, When young people go to a um, dojo to study karate or kung fu or some martial art, uh, they have to learn not just how to, to perform the physical acts of these um, um, disciplines, but there are many psychological disciplines that they have to learn that are all part of karate, that are all part of jujitsu, that are all part of uh, these things, goes beyond merely learning physical moves. And, uh, you know, some people think that's all that 
uh, martial arts consists of. No, 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 no. There's a whole mindset. There's a whole discipline that goes with martial arts. And um, for one thing, if, if you embrace the discipline of most martial arts, uh, they, act, they actually teach their disciples or their students uh, that fighting is a last resort. You want to use your mind, you want to use your mouth to try to de-escalate and uh, resolve a situation long before you get to the point where you're throwing fists and karate chops, okay? So the same is true for believers. This is why I believe with all my heart the enemy is laughing in the 21st century because so-called Christian churches, and I'm sorry to come down so hard on evangelicals and fundamentalists, but they're the biggest offenders, uh, they've convinced themselves and they've convinced their congregations that uh, they're perfect, you know, they're good, everything's good. We just need to come against these people over here. We just need to learn to come against these people. We just need to fight this battle. We just need to fight this moral issue. We just need to fight this um, societal battle, you know, for our society and, and for the morality of our nation and blah, 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 blah. And what you never hear coming from these pulpits. And then, of course, you've got the other side of the coin. You've got those who are preaching the prosperity delusion. Name it and claim it. You know, God wants to give you every little tiny thing you want. Bless God. God wants you rich. God wants you this. God wants you that. He wants you to have everything. No, 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 no. That's Santa Claus. You're confused. That's not God. And so what happens is God's church has been so <sighs> distracted by so many things, the enemy's laughing all the way to hell because half of the people in the church are walking right behind him and they're going to wind up in hell just as sure as I'm alive. And the reason is simply this. They're not in a church that actually teaches them how to live the Christian life. Their pastor never talks about loving your enemy. Their pastor never talks about praying for them that spitefully use them. Their pastor never talks about uh, what the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount and what he taught concerning loving people uh, that don't love you in return. And he said, you know, if you just love those that love you, well, don't publicans do that? Don't sinners do that? What? You know, what great thing are you accomplishing in acting like sinners and unbelievers? Hating people that hate you, being mad at people that are mad at you, mistreating people that mistreat you? Where, where are you different? Where is your Christian discipline? And so it's imperative, and I said it Sunday, and I'll say it again. I, I have no fear at all of standing before God in the judgment concerning the ministry that I've been engaged in now for the last 30 years because I know that in our church every Sunday our message is not about those people over there. Our message is about, folks, God has called us to step up higher. He has called us to embrace a greater discipline. He has called us to live a life that is a testimony and a witness to a lost and dying world. He has called us to not only preach the gospel, but to live a life that demonstrates the principles of grace and mercy and love and compassion and charity so that when people watch the way we live, 
they're drawn to our message. There's a lot of Christians only, they think that the gospel's all about preaching at people. <laughs> no, if you'd live what the Word of God teaches, you wouldn't have to preach half as much as you do because people would see the blessing and the divine favor in your life. They would see God moving in your life and they would want to embrace the message that you embrace because after all, look at the results it produces. But when you're as hateful and as malicious and as homophobic and as xenophobic and as evil and as wicked and as nasty as the sinner who lives next door to you who doesn't go to church and doesn't claim to be a Christian and doesn't claim to believe in God, <coughs> then my friend, you can preach till the cows come home and you're preaching to folks who have closed their ears to you. You're no longer a living epistle. You are no longer a living example of what the Word of God preaches and teaches us. And so, therefore, your message becomes moot. It, it's powerless to accomplish anything. So, this is why, folks, I keep telling people, this is why... Uh, in the last days, the Word of God said that uh, it, within the church, men would heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. That means that the church, just like Israel did in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God talked about Israel embracing messengers, prophets, priests, uh, who preached what they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear and elevating them and causing them to be enriched and fattened. The, the Old Testament tells us of this. This was a pattern in Israel. Guess what? The modern day church is following right in the footsteps of our older sister Israel. We're doing all the same things. We're doing exactly what Israel did, walking in disobedience, walking in rebellion, uh, doing our own thing, and all the while claiming to be God's chosen, all the while claiming to be his sole representatives of righteousness and godliness, when in reality you don't even know what godliness and righteousness looks like. Because if you knew what righteousness and godliness looked like, you would know that baking a cake for a gay wedding ain't nothing but a thing. You're, you're doing your job. You're doing what you advertise you do. You bake cakes. You, you're not putting a seal of approval on any marriage that you bake a cake for. Who on earth gives a flying fake whether you approve of any couple that comes into your bakery to buy a cake? That straight couple that comes in, they could care less whether you approve of their marriage or not because that's none of your business. So why on earth do we try to make something out of nothing? The Word of God gives us off-ramps when it comes to situations like this. It teaches us to obey every ordinance of man. The only time the church disobeyed an ordinance was when they were commanded to no longer preach in the name of Jesus Christ. So if you're ever told not to preach in the name of the Lord, by all means, feel free to keep preaching. But all these other issues that you knucklehead fundamentalists and evangelical lunatics claim are so important. Honey, you are violating the word of God. You are walking in rebellion. You are stiff-necked. You are stubborn. You're following your own path, and you are an embarrassment to the Christian church and to the message of Jesus Christ. 
You ought to be baking the best cake you can bake and handing it to the folks when they come to pick it up and saying to them, have a wonderful day. God bless you. That's what you ought to be doing. All right. Now I'm getting a little carried away, getting off into a, a, a little caveat there. So let's begin with our list of uh, avenues the enemy uses to gain access uh, into the life of an individual. First of all, we look at Satan, evil spirits, take advantage of intended as well as unintended invitations. Some satanic and ancient religions, including many, which are still practiced in our world today, actually involve the practice of inviting a spirit to enter and occupy an individual. This gentleman I spoke of earlier, who practiced a uh, Africani religion, he told me how that uh, one part of their religion, they have to go out into a wilderness, out into a desert, out into a forest, and they have to find as secluded a place as they can possibly find, and they literally draw a circle on the ground, and they then have to sit in that circle, and they sit there, and they wait, 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 sometimes for days, until, listen to this, until a spirit takes up residence within them. But as I've said, these people erroneously convince themselves that they are able to control these demonic spirits. They know it's a demon, but they believe that somehow through their mystical, magical, religious powers that they can control even a demon spirit. So basically, they get a tiger by the tail and they've convinced themselves that they can control the tiger. And uh, this is part of their religious practice. When you look at voodoo practices, when you look at Santeria, when you look at uh, many occult and witchcraft, black magic practices, they have very similar belief systems. That is obviously an intentional invitation to a spirit, offering them uh, yourself as a host. Um, even God follows this rule of intended and unintended invitations. If you have a heart that's soft toward God, if you open the door to him even the slightest bit, then he is going to do his best to communicate with you. He's going to do his best to try to uh, woo you, to attract you. The word, the word of God declares, it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. So the Lord's going to do his best to try to kind of, you know, draw you over to his side. He doesn't just grab you and make you go in this direction. But like a lover who is trying to win the love of uh, the object of his affection, the Lord will woo you and he'll try to lure you, as it were, toward him. And the word of God said, draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The more you open the door to God, the more the Lord will come in. And as that happens, the enemy is then forced out. So the Spirit of the Lord uh, occupies no one who is not open to and welcoming of his Spirit. Thus the Lord commanded his disciples in John 20, 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why would the Lord command his disciples to receive the Holy Ghost if God was just going to pour it on you regardless? 
<laughs> if he was going to decide, well, you're going to get the Holy Ghost, so here, I'm just going to give it to you. No, there has to be a reception on our part. There has to be permission on our part. There has to be an intended uh, invitation on the part of the believer. In Romans 6, 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you notice here, Paul literally uses the term yield. He said, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. If you surrender your power, if you surrender your authority, if you surrender yourself to something uh, sinful, ungodly, wicked, false, untruthful, uh, 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 if you surrender yourself to a ungodly or faithless response or reaction to a life circumstance or to distress, then you are literally making yourself at that point uh, subject to a spirit that is not God. By the same token, as we strive to live for the Lord and to live by the disciplines of his word, then we are submitting ourselves, we are yielding ourselves to God. Now, in Ephesians 4.27, the word of God said, Neither give place to the devil. So Paul is telling us, whatever you do, don't give the enemy an opportunity. Do not intentionally or unintentionally uh, offer him an invitation to step into your life or to step into your circumstance. In Romans 6, 11 through 14, Paul writes to the church at Rome, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Listen now, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, Romans 6, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. In this passage, Paul is using the universal usage of the word sin. The universal usage of the word sin speaks of unbelief in broad terms. It is not simply the breaking of rules but rather it is the source of all disobedience, which is unbelief. Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because Eve was made first to disbelieve God. All sin is born of unbelief. It starts at unbelief. And so therefore... It is imperative that we, the Word of God said, uh, that we bring every thought into, the, uh, into captivity to the obedience of Christ, okay? Uh, this is what the Word of God is talking about, folks. It's a matter of trying to get ourselves in a place. The Scripture teaches the just shall live by faith getting ourselves to the place. And believe me, it's a struggle. And the Word of God 
teaches this, and we know it is. Uh, but we're trying as believers to get ourselves in that groove so that in everything, in every circumstance, in every situation, we are responding in faith. We're trusting God. We're leaning on the Lord. I love that old song that we sing in our church, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean. That is what the Christian life is all about. Every day we are learning to lean Every day we're learning to trust him. Every day we are learning to walk by faith and not by sight. And this is a work the Word of God teaches that the Lord will continue in us unto the day of Christ. This work will never be finished. It's going to keep on keeping on till the Lord comes because well, as human beings, we are constantly barraged by emotions. We're constantly barraged by circumstances. And so we're constantly in and out of faith. We're constantly in and out of trusting God and believing God. But the key is that we are focused on learning to lean. Who I'm going to tell you, you wonder why it's so important to be part of a church where the message is biblical and accurate, where the message is balanced, where you're being taught how to live this thing and not merely being cheerled and told how God wants to, you know, shower you with diamonds and give you fancy cars and fancy houses. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, um, we need a revival in America so bad it's not even funny. But what evangelicals and fundamentalists think is a revival is getting everybody over there to act the way we think they ought to act, when in fact they're not even close to acting the way that God would have them to behave. And nobody in that movement is even trying to help them to get there. No, they're too busy looking at themselves like they're better than the other guy. They remind me of the publican that uh, came into the temple. And, uh, you know, it, it, one man comes in and the word of God said, he looked to the ground, said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The other man said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like him. I tithe, I do this, I do that. Oh, I'm so good. And uh, the Lord said, which of them went home justified? Well, it was the one who acknowledged he was a sinner, acknowledged he was imperfect. The fool who stood there bragging about himself to God didn't understand that he didn't possess half of what he was professing. So it's important that we be in a church that preaches godly living, that preaches Christ-likeness, that preaches about our need to strive to pursue godliness and holiness in our lives. The word of the Lord tells us in Romans 6, 16, again, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I read that to you a moment ago. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, Paul writes, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not listen to the language. I will not be brought under the power of, of any. So Paul says, does scripture teach that I can't drink alcohol? As a New Testament believer, am I forbidden from drinking alcohol? No, I'm not. I don't care what First Pentecostal Church says. That's not what the Bible says. However, I will not be brought under the power of any of these 
things. I may have a right. I may be able to do certain things. God uh, may allow me a certain amount of latitude. I'm supposed to exercise moderation in all things. Uh, but whatever it takes, and if that means that I have to make up my mind, that I'm just not even going to mess with the stuff because I know how easily folks can get caught up in it. And next thing you know, it's controlling you. You're not controlling it. So therefore, I, I know that it may not be a matter of, of breaking God's commandment or breaking God's law, but at the same time, uh, there is a, a real possibility of that thing overtaking me and my coming under its power. And for that reason, I choose to avoid it altogether. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? He said, are your desires that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. This is the 21st century church in a nutshell right here, folks. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Here he's using the term adulterer and adulteress in a prophetic sense. In other words, this is speaking of spiritual adultery, not being faithful to the teaching of God's word. He said, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now listen, submit yourselves therefore to God. If you're going to open the door, open the door to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Submission to God is one and the same as resisting the devil. To do one is to accomplish the other. Notice again James' use of the words adulterers and adulteresses. This is a prophetic use of these terms, the same way that fornication is often used in its prophetic usage rather than a literal usage. Here James, the brother of the Lord, arms uh asserts, I should say, that friendship or fraternization with the world is akin to cheating on our marriage to the Lord as the betrothed bride of Christ. All these people who are so worried about what kind of house they live in, what kind of car they drive, what kind of clothes they wear, what neighborhood they live in, do these fools not realize that that is friendship with the world. My God, we sing that old song, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what would I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home 
in this world anymore. I'm not, I could care less about driving a Rolls Royce. I could care less about having a Mercedes Benz. I could care less about what neighborhood I live in or which house the Lord allows me to have for the love of God. This world is something that I genuinely do not embrace. It is not mine. I have an inheritance. I'm going somewhere better. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hallelujah. My God, when are we actually going to believe what we preach? When are we ever going to genuinely embrace what we sing about in our songs? I'm going to tell you, the old timers, there's a reason they used to shout and dance in the aisles and run the aisles and rejoice in the Holy Ghost when they were having church because those folks believed what they were singing. They believed the message that they sang about on Sunday. They believed the message that the preacher was preaching. And you could tell they believed it. You could tell they embraced it from the very depth of their spirit by reason of their reaction and their response. Man, they'd shout and get happy. Talk about glory. Talk about heaven. Hallelujah. Talk about leaving this whole world behind. Talk about not caring about what neighborhood you live in or what label is in your clothes. And those old saints would jump up on their feet and start dancing while the preacher was still preaching because they believed what they were saying. Got news for you, folks. You can call me a lunatic all you want to. I still believe it. And I still shout and dance when we sing about it because it's still as real to me as it was 58 years ago when I was born into this thing. My God, have mercy. Curiosity killed the cat. The number one cause of demonic activity is without question the simple act of curiosity. This can include the use of various forms of divination, Ouija boards, tarot cards, seeking out psychics, trying to communicate with the dead, experimenting with witchcraft or the occult, these things can open the door to demonic activity as one's venturing into the spirit realm in an unadvised manner is seen by demons as an invitation. If you wander into the hangout of a violent inner city gang, they're not going to care that you accidentally wandered into their crack house or to their headquarters, they're going to look upon you and treat you in the same way they would someone who purposely invaded their turf. Curiosity, my friend, is dangerous. Again, this is why occult practic uh, practitioners and witches, psychics, fortune tellers, wizards, etc., were condemned by God within the context of the law of Moses, and they were ordered to be executed and exterminated. Just their presence alone <clears throat> had the potential of leading naive curiosity seekers astray, getting them uh, into deep waters, having inadvertently opened a door that they will not readily know how to close. In Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. So they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know nothing about Jesus. But they're trying to use the name of the Lord, and they're referring to it and saying, you know, uh, this is the guy that Paul preaches about. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. You, you don't venture into demonic territory, folks, lacking knowledge and understanding of how these things work. Uh, and those of us that do understand how these things work, you don't see us running to be uh, involved in these things either. And it's not because I'm afraid of them. It's not because I think they have any power over me or they're able to exercise influence over me. No, no. It is because uh, as children of God, it's kind of like I was talking about earlier about jujitsu and uh, karate and what have you. Um, the first principle you're taught is you don't want to fight if you don't have to fight. And that's the same principle, in essence, that the Word of God teaches us. You don't just march into Satan's territory uh, in order to pick a fight. That's a very bad idea, you know. Uh, and especially these people who uh, don't know what they're doing, and, and they're not walking in relationship with Jesus Christ. A lot of these uh ghost hunters and a lot of these paranormal quote-unquote experts on TV, you'll notice that they try to use religious uh, references and, you know, religious uh, tools, crucifixes and crosses and oil and holy water and incense and all this foolishness. Uh, and yet, they're not coming from a place of faith at all. They're not coming from a place of relationship. They don't know what on earth they're doing. They're, they're just trying to throw stuff at the fan and see what sticks. You know, they're just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that is dangerous. Those people, I'm telling you, uh, there was a couple who used to appear on uh, one of those shows with Zach uh, ba uh, Bagans or whatever his name is. And uh, there was a married couple that used to appear on the show quite a bit, and they worked with the uh, recordings and, and e e um, EVPs and all this sort of thing. And I told Tommy for years, I said, just watch. I said, these people... The enemy may let them get away for a long time doing what they do because they're useful idiots. They're helping him to propagate false uh, information. They're helping the enemy to convince people that the word of God is false. It can't be relied upon. The Bible is untrue. You don't have to worry about judgment. After death, you know, if you decide you want to spit in God's eye and hang around on earth for eternity, you can do that to avoid judgment. That's what these people are convincing uh, viewers of. I said, you know what? You just watch said, these people are opening themselves up. At some point, the enemy is going to exact a very powerful, very negative, very destructive price from them. You watch. Well, this uh, John and Linda, I think it was, uh, wound up in a situation where the husband killed the wife and then killed himself. And I said, you know, this is the sort of thing that I'm worried about. A lot of these so-called paranormal experts, you watch, you watch over the years. You're going to see them committing suicide. You're going to see them um, uh, uh, becoming excessively violent and committing crimes and doing things that get themselves into all kinds of trouble, if not cost them their lives, because you don't play with spirits. You do not play with demons. They don't play. They are playing for blood, honey. 
The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. They may act like they're a cat and they're just playing with that mouse for the moment. But at some point, they're going to give in to their instinct, and they're going to kill that mouse. And that's what these spirits will do. More people have invited trouble by inadvertently getting involved with some type of spiritual practice, which opens a doorway into the spirit realm. Secondly, in our list today, uh, Satan and evil spirits will take advantage of proximity, meaning you get burned simply because you get too close to the stove. You don't have to walk into the furnace to get burned. All you got to do is get close enough to it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Notice Paul's not talking here about people. He's talking about actions. He says, do not engage in anything that puts you in close proximity to unfruitful works of darkness. This is why we do not seek out um, fortune tellers. This is why we do not uh, go to one to read tarot cards or to tell us our future. Uh, we do not try to um, Engage with someone who, who claims to communicate with the dead. No, you're putting yourself too close to the fire. You're going to get burned. Leviticus 19.31, this is from the Old Testament law. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards. Listen to the language. To be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. Proximity. You're too close. You get too close. You know the old saying, you lay down with dogs, you're going to get fleas, okay? You get too close, you're going to wind up opening a door, and that's then those demons are going to take advantage of it. If I had a nickel for every time, I've cast demons out of somebody. And if you trace back, uh, the the origins of the activity in their life. It all started when they decided, well, I missed my mother and I just wanted to talk to my mother. So I went to this psychic and, you know, blah, blah. and they didn't see a whole lot of anything happening right away. They didn't experience a whole lot of negativity right away. But all of a sudden, that door just got cracked open enough. And then one spirit after another began to push their way into this person's life, all of a sudden they found themselves being overcome by depression and despair and despondency. All of a sudden they found themselves more and more disconnected from their faith. Uh, they found it harder and harder to lean on the Lord and to trust God. And they were being separated from their walk with God. These spirits were getting in the way and interfering and creating this wall for them. They didn't see it. They didn't understand. But they look back, and if you trace it back, you realize this is where they first opened the door. I have a cousin who uh, lost her daughter, my cousin, to uh, what was purported to be suicide. And uh, one night I was in my bed and I couldn't sleep very well and the spirit I, I heard I kept hearing this loud loud ticking like a clock was ticking real real loud I didn't have any clocks in my bedroom that ticked I didn't have you know nowadays we've got all these digital clocks I didn't have a clock that you know tick tick ticks but I was hearing this loud tick 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 
And uh, the Lord showed me my cousin, and he showed me her uh, possessed by demons, not the one who commits suicide, her mother, who's still with us. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to warn her. She's tempted to try to communicate with her daughter. She's tempted to seek out someone to try to communicate with her daughter. And you need to warn her. Said that will be the most dangerous thing she's ever done in her life. And she's going to open a door. She won't know how to close. And uh, I said, uh, well, Lord, you know, I... I I'll try to I'll try to talk to her. I'll try to, you know, I'll try to communicate with her as soon as I can. And then he spoke to me and he said, You hear the clock ticking? Time is of the essence. So all of a sudden I realized that he was causing me to hear this clock tick and that that was uh, symbolizing and representing that it was imperative that I speak to my cousin as soon as I possibly could. So I made arrangements to um, go to her town and visit with her. And my mother came with me. And uh, we went there, and it seemed like every time I tried to talk to my cousin about these things, my mother just jumped in there and started some tomfoolery distracting and, and pulling the conversation away. And I couldn't hardly talk to my cousin about what I had wanted to talk to her about. So finally, at the end of our visit, I was able to get her alone for a few minutes. And I told her, I said, Honey, whatever you do, don't you dare give in to the temptation of trying to communicate with the dead. The Lord spoke to me about you in this. And my cousin said, Oh, I know better than that. I would never do that. To this day, I, I think she was lying to me. I'm going to tell you honestly. Um, long story short, and Tommy can tell you because he knows her. Ever since then, that woman's life has been on a downward trajectory like you've never seen a person's life ever. It is her situation has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And there have been many, many times when God gave me a word of knowledge for someone and they'll stand there and try to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, that what I'm saying is not accurate and they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. And, honey, when God gives me something, I got news for you. You can stand there and deny it till the cows come home. I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'll, I'll say, okay, all right, whatever you say. But when God shows me something and I know it's from the Lord, I know that you're lying to me. I know you're telling me a fib. Just like Peter knew that Ananias and Sapphira were lying when they claimed they sold their property and gave the full of the proceeds, as other believers had done. And, uh, you know, and I really believe my cousin did exactly what I warned her not to do. And the evidence in her life since that all came about points to the fact that she did indeed, because you can see spirit after spirit after spirit that has moved into this woman's life. And she now is riddled with all kinds of things. And I can't help her because at this point, she's holding hands with all these little devils like their little children crossing the street with an adult. She's holding hands with them. And until she gets tired of them, and wants to be free of them, uh, there's nothing that I or anybody can do for her. So you got to be careful. Don't get too close to the fire. The enemy will use that proximity to uh, take advantage of an open door. 
1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. This principle is true both in physical, literal applications as well as in spiritual applications. Here we learn that a married man who beds a prostitute or a woman of poor moral conduct invites that harlot not only into his bed, but in effect into his marriage. He has now become a polygamist. He is joined to both women, the harlot and his wife. God sees no difference between recreational sex and unifying sex. We want, we love as human beings, we love to look at it like, oh, they're different, you know. Uh, I love my wife. I'm just having fun with this woman over here. Well, that's great. The only problem is that is not how God designed these things to work. So that woman you're having fun with over here got news for you. In God's eyes, you're married to that woman. Now you've got two wives. And if you're a real whoremonger and floating around messing with everything that has two legs, then you're, you've got a whole, you know, tent full of wives. Our relationship with the Lord is similar. If we invite an unclean spirit into our lives, it is not seen as a different type of spiritual transaction than our union with God. It is seen as inviting an unclean element into our spiritual marriage, and thus we have defiled our marriage bed with an unclean person or, in this instance, a spirit. So fornication has a spiritual definition. In 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 8, almost done tonight, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. 1 Corinthians 10, 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, I read this a moment ago, I'm reading it again, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Proximity, folks, you don't want to get too close to these things. Uh, you get in bed with something, you, you're... you're inviting that thing into your life. You're inviting that thing into your spiritual marriage, as it were, with the Lord. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Parental relationships can also result in a child being vexed by an evil spirit. It's about proximity. The kid doesn't have a choice but to be close to the parent. But if the parent has invited something into their life and they become uh, oppressed by something or vexed by something, you're making that child now have to contend with whatever it is you've invited into your life simply by reason of their proximity to you. A believing parent, according to the Word of God, brings blessing and favor upon the life of their spouse and children by reason of proximity or by reason of their relationship. 
In 1 Corinthians 7, 14, the apostle Paul writes, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So we see, again, I told you the principles supply on both sides of the coin. God follows the same identical principles that apply uh, to the other side of the spiritual coin. And proximity is either going to bring a curse or it's going to bring a blessing. And you've got to be careful about how close you get to the stove. In Matthew 15, 22, And behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. In Matthew 17, 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and off into the water. Where did these children open a door to demonic spirits? Where did they open a door that they all of a sudden are possessed, vexed, or oppressed by a demon spirit? Chances are they didn't, but the likelihood is that mom or dad did it for them. And this is why it is so important, mom and dad, that you understand you are not just your child's physical caregiver. You are their spiritual caregiver. You are their spiritual doorkeeper, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why parents have to take seriously their responsibility to their children not only in engaging in things that we ought not to engage in, are we opening a door to a potential uh, vexation or even a potential oppression in our own lives, but our children simply by reason of their proximity to us are going to wind up being vexed or oppressed as well. And uh, I've seen many, many circumstances where parents, for instance, who engaged in witchcraft and the occult, uh, who engaged in santeria and um, uh, psychic readings and uh, played with Ouija boards. And I mean, I could go down a list of my alone. The parents were the ones that did these things. And yet, as that child grew up, that child wound up under a powerful vexation or under a very powerful oppression. And it had nothing to do with an action of their own. It had simply to do with their proximity to one who was involved in these things. Okay? All right, folks, that concludes our study for this week. That is our session for this week. I hope that this information has been enlightening and encouraging and inspiring uh, for you, and it's helped you to see and understand some things. Uh, this, Folks, this is why as believers we're to live prayerful lives and we're to... Uh, put all our energy into trying our best to live and walk by faith. Amen. And if we'll do that, believe me, we can walk in victory. And if we slip and if we fall, it's as easy as confessing uh, our sin before God and the matter is settled in heaven as well as in earth. But uh, it is so important that we focus in our lives on righteousness, which means simply doing right. It's not about being perfect. It's about doing right. In every situation, in every circumstance, there is a right way to respond and a wrong way to respond. There is a right way to act and a wrong way to act. And uh, we ought to at least have a hunger in our heart and a desire in our heart. Lord, help me. You know, Lord, even when I falter, even when I fail, you know that the desire of my heart is to do right. Amen. 
They that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Praise the Lord. We want to go to the Lord in prayer as we close this session tonight. Master, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace, as is our privilege as children of God. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Master, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I ask God that the presence of God would descend upon every home and every individual under the sound of my voice at this moment. Let the power and presence of a living God infiltrate every corner of their residence, every corner of their home, drive out from before them every unclean spirit, everything that would exalt itself against the higher knowledge of a living God. Master, heal today those festering wounds that cause us to respond and to react in a manner that is less than godly and less than Christ-like. Help us, Lord, to embrace faith. Help us, Lord, always to look upward with hope. Let us be like the psalmist who declared, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Help us, Lord, in every circumstance at all times to look to you, to trust you, to believe you. And help us, Lord, to make right decisions concerning those with whom uh, we interact at a spiritual level, those with whom we rub shoulders, those with whom we get too close so as not to open any doors inadvertently and allow the enemy an opportunity to bring trouble and strife, the word of God declaring, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Master, in the name of Jesus, make this study, make this series come alive in our hearts. Help us, Lord, not only to embrace it, but to reach out by faith and to grab hold of those things that today we are learning until you're able to minister deliverance and healing and victory in our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight. And give us victory over every unclean spirit, every demon power from hell that would try to exert any influence in our lives. We claim victory and liberty in the name of Jesus. Devil, you're a liar and the father of lies. You have no place in our lives. You have no place in our thinking. You have no place today in our circumstance. We welcome only the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God alone is welcome in our homes, in our circumstance, and in our lives. Master, go with us from this place. Keep us in your peace. Let the joy of the Lord overflow in our hearts. For it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. We ask all this today in none other than that wonderful, sacred, saving name, Yeshua the Christ, even Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I'm glad you were able to be with us today. I hope you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time as we celebrate our life in Christ Jesus and then, of course, if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, come on down. We need you to come help us. We're trying to do something powerful, wonderful, life-changing, nation-affecting uh, here in Alabama. We need you to come help us. We can't do it alone. 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537, Huntsville, Alabama. 35801. Come be with us at 3 o'clock 
on Sunday afternoon. Next Wednesday, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, join us online for our Bible study and as we continue this series. And do keep me in prayer. I'm traveling first thing in the morning to uh, Kansas, where Amy and Clint and uh, Brady and Camille are. And uh, Brady has made the decision of his own accord to be baptized in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins as is commanded in Acts 2.38. And I have the honor and privilege of being his uh, uh, preacher of choice to administer this ordinance. So I'll be going to Kansas. I'm going to stay a couple of days. I love spending time with Amy and Clinton. We don't get to see them a whole lot. They've been extended members and following our ministry now for pretty near a decade. And uh, so I'm going to be able to spend a little bit of time with them. And I'll be coming back Saturday. Of course, I'm always in the pulpit on Sunday. So keep me in prayer as I travel. And until we see, a, see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.